Thank you, Jess. So I'm really excited, audience, because I've never met Jess before. <laughs> I know about her. I've read about her. She's amazing. So I feel like I'm getting to know her along with you. So this is going to be great. So first of all, Jess, tell us what you do in so, one line. <laughs> okay, so I work at, in the Centre for Plastic Electronics at Imperial College London, and I use carbon-based materials to make flexible electronic devices. So things like light emitting diodes for mobile phone displays and also sensors. So something that everyone in this audience would have? Everyone has a mobile phone, I'm thinking. Yeah, so yes, we are, we are <laughs> and, working and on that tweeting. kind of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So now, as I said, I know you for not your work, brilliant though that is, I know you as a kind of one-woman powerhouse for advocacy, particularly through your work with Wikipedia. So how did you come to do it and why? Um, so I reckon everyone in this room knows that science, particularly physics, isn't, isn't very diverse and we don't have enough young women or senior women in it. I've tried throughout my whole PhD to fix that. So I, I went to a bunch of schools, I did loads of talks, but it's, it's really hard to solve that. And, and the big challenge is that young girls particularly face a huge amount of stereotyping and bias that stops them from choosing subjects like physics in the first place. Last year, I read Angela Sayini's Inferior, and, and that really changed my life because it gave me all the evidence, the kind of stories about how bad the science was behind all these stereotypes, how women have been biased against for the whole of history, and how actually the majority of history has been written by men, about men, for other men. And did that apply to Wikipedia as well? Well, of course that applies to Wikipedia as well, but actually it, it, taught me, it taught me something. It taught me that there have been all these women who have been standing up and shouting and fighting back. You know, mm -hmm. when women couldn't vote, we couldn't graduate from university, we couldn't own property. There were women writing to Charles Darwin saying, you know, it's not okay to call us intellectually inferior. We can't do any of these things. And I thought we can do that now. And, and Wikipedia is phenomenal. It is such a powerful platform. It's used for education. It's used to find journalists for articles. But unfortunately, just like the majority of history, or physics departments, it's also really biased in favor of men. And the majority of content on Wikipedia is written by white, white men in America. And the biographies that they write are mainly about men. So only 17% of the biographies on English-speaking Wikipedia are about women. And that really annoys me because I, don't, I want young people to go on this website and read about all the phenomenal women scientists that I know of and the people of color and the LGBTQ plus scientists. So tell me about the best Wikipedia page, your favorite, the one that you've created? Oh gosh, it's so hard. I know we were talking about this backstage and I have like 60, 60 ideas in my head right now. We just want so, one. So, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. So I think that my favorite one for speaking at TED London and speaking particularly about women is Roma Agraral. So she's a structural engineer. She grew up in India, New York, and London. She studied physics first and then went on to do structural engineering, also at Imperial College London, and then became the structural engineer for the top of the shard. So she came in when the shard was struggling to be built and completely changed the way that they did it and you know revolutionized the engineering but also did that phenomenal construction on the top and has been a huge advocate and supporter for young women in engineering has written a book on engineering she's a great role model in so many ways and actually hearing her story and hearing about her was just so exciting I I wanted to check more about her on Wikipedia but she didn't have a Wikipedia page so that's incredible yeah well actually it happens more often than you'd think I, I saw Susan Goldberg who's the first woman to edit National Geographic since it started in 1888. And I saw her talking once, and she was so great. She was so powerful. You know, she, she came into National Geographic in 2016. She pushed for this edition on gender that they published in January last year that went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. And she's done so many phenomenal things for that magazine, really giving the kind of content creation to the readers, changing completely the way they tell stories. And she was so inspirational, and she's had such a great legacy in journalism. And actually, seeing her speak and wanting to find out more about her, there was nowhere that had that full collection. Mm. And hers was a really fun page to make as well. So sorry, I said I'd tell you about one and I've already told you about two. <laughs> That's okay, we, we could talk forever. But one of the things that you know, you're most associated with is diversity. So um, you, you make these efforts. What is wrong, do you think, with the current diversity efforts? Because loads of places plow money into them. You know, you go anywhere, there's diversity all over the place, but we... Are we making progress in the right way? I think there are two kind of big challenges. One is obviously getting enough girls and diverse audiences to study sciences like physics in the first place, and the other one is keeping them in academia, say. 
For the young people's education, I think we have a real challenge in this country. So we don't have enough skill specialist teachers teaching subjects like physics, computer science, maths. It's really hard to get a young person to choose a subject for something like an A-level, which is very, very important, if they've been stereotyped out of that subject for their entire life. And then you get there and you say, oh, by the way, your teacher doesn't even have an A-level in physics. Please come and study it. It's a really hard thing to convince someone to do that. So we have that one massive challenge. And I think that the majority of diversity efforts are all very well intentioned, but they're by, by kind of a big kind of executive board who think, let's just put 100,000 pounds into a series of videos, that will change the world. Or let's get someone to come in and do a talk in lunchtime because that will inspire everyone. And that doesn't work, right? We've seen it doesn't work. We've tried that for decades and nothing's changed with the numbers. We've never actually sat down and tried to firstly invest in our teachers, but also invest in young people's confidence. And I think that's what the massive challenge is. For, for people within academia and at universities, there are so many biases and barriers against women. You know, there's sexual harassment, there's bullying, there's huge bias in peer review and the allocation of grants. There's still absolutely abysmal shared parental leave. And, and the reason that it frustrates me so much is that if we wanted to solve this kind of scientifically, like we should as a bunch of scientists, we'd speak to people with money in positions of power. Diversity, diversity won't change within science departments if you've just got the underrepresented minority groups speaking about how rubbish it is to be an underrepresented minority group. You actually need those senior people to say, I'm going to invest in this. We're going to completely have a zero tolerance policy on bullying. We're going to kick out all these people who've been accused of sexual harassment because unless you do that, you won't change anything. But now what you're saying is that we need to start way, way before that and maybe target parents, teachers. I mean, if, if you I mean, there are maybe teachers in the audience, parents in the audience, I'm not quite sure. But, you know, what, what can we all as individuals do to... To kind well, of I think I mean, we, all have, we all have the decision as individuals about what stories we tell, right? We, we have, we have the, the chance every single day to challenge stereotypes, to tell people who are underrepresented, who are being silenced, that they're brilliant, to, to really amplify their voices. And, you know, when you're giving a class, maybe choose a few people from throughout history that this classroom may not have heard about. If you're teaching something about light emitting diodes, talk about what scientists are doing when they're researching that. Make it a lot more real. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest barriers to young people's perception of science is that they don't see how it fits with them in the real world. And mm -hmm. giving them kind of real, relatable role models who are doing these kind of jobs day to day is actually something that would have inspired me so much as a young person. But then also really recognizing that it's not an ability issue. Girls and boys are equally as good at all different kinds of subjects and really thinking actually it's a confidence thing. And what I need to do as a parent or a teacher is really work on those young people's confidence so that all of them realize that they can do anything. And that, and that actually what you're talking about is, you know, giving people that sense of they're not inferior, they can, they can do it brings us very neatly to our absent friend Angela. Um, now you said you read that book and it changed your life. Yeah. Um, and you're now doing a fundraising campaign. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, of course. So Inferior absolutely changed my life, not only because it gave me all of these references about how women have been kind of historically pushed out of academia and, and science in general. But it also gave me this network of women and men scientists all over the world who are determined to change that. So last summer, just after I read it, I took it everywhere I went. I took it to every conference I went to. I took it to all of these different places where I was speaking, to New Zealand, to America, to all across Europe, much to the frustration of my mother who kept seeing all these inferior copies that I was ordering. And, and actually, I gave it to a bunch of young people too. So I often have interns and work experience students in the lab at Imperial, and, and I got all of them reading it, and they were so inspired and motivated by it. You know, it's not just enough to tell a girl that, you know, oh, just please be a bit more confident. You've actually got to give her the tools to realize that none of the feelings that she's feeling is because of her. So we set up a crowdfunding campaign. I set it up in, in the summer this year. And it was to achieve what? It was to try and get a copy of Inferior into every single girl's state school in the country, because I thought, I'm not that popular. There are only 200 girls' state schools. Let's do it. It took one night to do that. So in after that, I was like, okay, I've got a few more friends than I think. So, so we pushed it, and, and um, actually we got enough money within 12 days to get it into every single secondary state school in the whole of the UK and Ireland. <laughs> That's not all. That is not all. Um, yeah. It has gone... 
international. So yeah, actually, the publishers are so phenomenal. So Fourth Estate have come on board and really supported us, and they're making a special edition for schools. And now people in New Zealand have started, Canada, and we've started a crowdfunder in New York as well. And you said about Spain and France. Well, and, all of them are getting on board, them. especially yes. with the Wikipedia editing too. So it's been absolutely kind of phenomenal Excellent. journey of people getting ex excited by Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And you have become a real figurehead for this the energy and advocacy. Have you had moments of self-doubt, pushback? Because I know that you were contacted once by a male PhD student that said, hey, you're kind of biasing Wikipedia yeah, I mean, by getting all these women in. <laughs> it, was, it was quite funny. So, so it was kind of in the early summer and someone wrote to me and said I was doing it firstly for self-publicity and secondly, I was damaging the Wikipedia community. So at the time, I'd been making Wikipedia pages for half a year and just kind of tweeting one Wikipedia page a day, thinking like, oh, this is a nice thing to do. And no one had really been paying attention. And then someone told me I was doing it for self-publicity. And then suddenly I got all this phenomenal amount of publicity, which was, <laughs> I mean, like, sucks to be them. But um, <laughs> after, after that, I think I realized that actually, you know, if, if I'm angering those kind of people, then I'm probably doing the right thing. And of course, there are going to be people who don't think that all of these sensational women and people of color should be on Wikipedia, but actually they totally should be. And the response from people who support it has been so encouraging and so much more positive. I really don't care what they have to say. And, and you've talked about... <laughs> Changing the world, changing the world. Um, changing the world one Wikipedia page at a time, I think. Um, so we talked about women, but also sexuality, color, you know, ethnicity, just uh, how, how about that? I mean, are, are there efforts being made there too? Sure, there are huge efforts. I think probably all of the kind of diversity stuff, if we particularly focus on science, started with women because the data is so much easier to collect. You know, you, you may declare that kind of thing on a form when you submit it. It's much easier to pull that information. If I speak from a Wikipedia perspective first, you can find out what gender a biography is about just by looking at the pronouns usually. And, and whilst that might not be entirely reliable, people do do that. When you start to go to ethnicity or sexuality, it's much harder to collect that data. And actually, the numbers are so small at the moment that you really risk calling people out right. and you really risk exposing who they are. So one of the non-science Wikipedia pages that I made recently was the first black woman professor of history in the UK. She only became a professor in October 2018. Amazing. If you wanted to collect that kind of data, you'd very quickly identify who that was. So, so I think that you have to start from a set where you're not going to discriminate. And I want quickly to ask you but who you think are the three scientists, maybe, that we don't know about that we should know about? I like how you say quickly, because you really want me to speed up. <laughs> I'm looking so, at the clock. <laughs> so, so many phenomenal ones. Once I think everyone should know about, there's an incredible engineer called Ozak Ezu, who grew up in Nigeria, and then she came to study engineering at Loughborough, did a PhD. She won the Institution of Engineering and Technology Young Women Engineer of the Year, and she just spends all of her time outside of her day job of engineering, inspiring other people to become an engineer. Another phenomenal scientist, a biochemist, called Rasheen Owens, who has worked in kind of industry and also academia, and she uses the materials that I work on to make implants for your brain that can detect and treat epilepsy in one go. She is so phenomenally inspirational and supportive. And the last one, okay, one of my favorite Wikipedia pages I ever made was Gladys West, who's an African-American mathematician who was born in the 1930s. And she was amazingly exciting to research because she worked on the early programming for GPS, but for the government. So at the time, she didn't, she didn't continue in a career in academia. She's still working on her PhD now, which is incredible. That is but awesome. she was also chosen as one of the BBC 100 women. So, so making a Wikipedia page has an impact. Brilliant. And you will have much more impact in the years to come. Thank you. Thank Jess. you.